All right, Scope TV, March 10th, 2010, 6 p.m. on the East Coast here. And I got my man Maurice Brown on the phone. Maurice, are you here tonight? What's happening, brother? What's up, man? I'm here. Good to be here. What's up, Mike? How you doing? I'm doing beautiful. A little bit jet lag. Just getting back from Jakarta for the Java Jazz Festival. Hmm. This man, he's... He stays moving. Let's get right into this interview. I know Maurice is busy tonight. Maurice, where are we speaking from tonight, and what were you up to today? Well, we're speaking from Brooklyn, New York, at my home. Um, basically, I'm just uh, up to just finishing up some sessions. A typical day for me, finishing up some horn arrangements for different producers. Mm. Now, when I first went over your media kit, I thought you were an R&B singer or a rapper, even. And then I put the new album in, and I was floored. Do you get that a lot? I do get that a lot. You know, uh, that's part of the way that uh, that uh, the music is presented, and the way that the album is presented too. Like in the album cover, it doesn't have my horn on there, so you, you kind of got a soulful pick where you're wondering: is he a singer? Is he a rapper? But then when you put the disc in, it right away it keeps your head nodding, so everyone's happy. Oh, no doubt about that. Maurice, how long were you working and recording The Cycle of Love? Well, I've been writing these music ever since uh, my debut album, The Bob Drop, in 2004. So I, I think I really started focusing my gears on this album 2006. And um, it's pre-Katrina, pre, uh, I started working on that. And once I got to New York, I settled down and I really started getting deep into the compositions and started scoping the way that I really wanted to present it. Mm. Maurice, I'm going to turn you up a bit, a little bit. I, I feel like, oh, there we go. Okay, good. I really, I want, I want the listeners to hear every word you say. Maurice, at what age did you pick up the trumpet and really begin to create music with that instrument that was truly yours? I guess when I, when I can say I really started getting into my own sound was probably soon around 2003 is when I started really starting getting into my own sound. Um, I guess I was playing on a lot of different albums and people started to recognize me just from my playing without seeing my pick, just the sound of the trumpet from different genres, be it jazz or hip-hop or R&B. Mm. Now, would you say that growing up, your peers, did they give you a hard time? You you were playing the trumpet as opposed to, I don't know, doing hip-hop or, or playing ball? Well, I did get some slack from some of my friends growing up. You know, they definitely wanted to hang out with me a lot more, but I spent a lot of time practicing, you know. Sometimes some days, 12 to 15 hour days practicing while everybody else is outside playing. But I think overall they respected the fact that, you know, I was dedicated to something and I was good at it. They say that children who learn an instrument perform better in both math and science, both in school and in real life. Are you, can you, uh, are you a testament to that? <laughs> I guess you could say that. I did keep up with 3.8 grade four average all while I was in college. Wow. Uh... Yeah, definitely. Wow. I think when you're, when you're doing with music, you use a different part of your brain, you know? Now, you lost a lot in Hurricane Katrina, and then you moved to Brooklyn. Why Brooklyn, and how has the New York scene embraced you and your music? Well, I, I got to come to Brooklyn after Katrina because... I was really, I really wanted to get into the hip hop and R and B thing more, and I felt like that's what was influencing my compositions a lot. And I thought, what better place to go to than Bed Stuy in Brooklyn? To, you know, to go to the heart of the soul where hip hop is at, where you know all these great musicians and producers and artists come from. Mm. Since I've been in New York, it's been, the response has been amazing. I mean, I've been like basically the top horn call guy for sessions. On the indie scene and the major scene. So, a lot of the indie projects that are coming out, they have my horns on it. And a lot of the projects coming out on the majors have my horn arrangements on it. So, quantification is what we call it. Maurice, why don't you brush your shoulder a little bit? Let the listeners know. I mean, you've you've worked with. Let the listeners know. I don't even want to tell them. Talib Kweli, let, let them know. Talib Kweli, uh, 
They lost the whole white man's John, John Legend, mm. Rita Franklin. He did it. <laughs> right, Maurice? And Diddy? He Didn't you work out. with Diddy? Right? Sean, you work with Puff, Puff Daddy? Yep, yeah, yeah, definitely. Puff Daddy's a remix for Angels with Jay Wonder. Diddy, definitely. Amazing. I love the message and the song behind Merry Go Round. Uh, when did you write that, and what inspired that song? Well, for me, with, with Merry Go Round, I mean, with the whole album, The Cycle of Love, every tone basically describes the stage that we go through in The Cycle of Love. And with Merry Go Round, I, I, I kept feeling myself uh, coming back to the same place, but yet uh, with a different perspective, and that's why I came up with the name Merry Go Round from. And I think uh, right away when you hear the song, can definitely relate to the title. Mm, and it's a beautiful song. Everybody, you got to hear it. Now, let's talk about your creative process. Do you hear the song in your head first, or how does that go? Uh, with my creative process, I, I definitely hear the melody first. The melody is the most important thing, and everything else is built around the melody. And then that's it. You just can, you write the music from there? Yeah, then I write the parts for the, depending on what players that are in my band. I've been keeping the same core group for the last three years, so that's been really cool. That's hard to do in New York, keep the same band. But uh, we've been, I've been definitely writing for the players in my band, too, with the melodies that, uh, that, that, that feel like old souls. All the songs feel like, you know, people hear them and they go, man, I, I feel like I, I must have heard this before, you know? Like, they have a, a old spirit to them. Now, how did it feel when Craig K, a personal friend of mine from Atlantic Records, when he asked you to tour with Laura Isabor, and how did you two meet? That's that's just an incredible opportunity right there. Yeah, well, I met Craig in the studio. I was actually laying some horns for a stale record that he was overseeing with uh, Y Club John and Jerry Wonder. And he came in and he heard the horns. He asked him to solo the horns. And he was like, man, they're, they're brilliant. I want you to do all my horns from now on. And that's how we basically built our relationship. From there, you know, he also asked me, could you put young and exciting bands together for my artist? And I said, yeah, that's what I could do that. And the first art artist he gave me was Laura. That's amazing. And just for those that don't know, Craig K, he, he pretty much brought T.I. to Atlantic. I mean, this is a a heavy hitter in, in the music industry. Maurice, what can music outlets like Scope, what can we do to help expose your incredible music and style to the mainstream? I guess jazz, I would say. Well, I guess uh, the, the, the best way you can expose people to music is just by putting it in front of them. You know, I'm a big believer in... Uh, I, I kind of, I don't focus so much on the genre, and I focus more on the feeling that m music gives me, and I try to make music that just feels good. I think that's what people are drawn to, you know, if it feels good, then we accept it. Awesome. We got two questions left. Maurice, you, you this this interview is just incredible. I'm, I'm really, we could keep going, but I know you got to get some rest. What MC could you see spitting 16 bars over one of your tracks, and why? If you had to pick one. Wow. Uh, one MC. It's such a hard decision, you know, because so many great MCs. But if I had to pick one MC, I would think uh, it'd probably have to be... Probably have to be Talib. I would call it. Mmm. Good choice. Very good. The reason why I would say that is because uh, Talib is, you know, I've worked with him before in the studio, too, and I kind of, I feel his, I'm feeling his vibe, and I know he's feeling my vibe. And so he's kind of on the same wavelength of some of the stuff that I'm doing. It's not your typical form that we're running right through. And Tyler is really like one of your uh, musicians, musicians like rapper. He's your favorite rapper, rapper, in other words, you know. So like, he can get up there and spit over any kind of form and, you know, and make it work. Now we got about 20 seconds, maybe even 15, Maurice. Where can listeners pick up the cycle of love? And what's coming up for Maurice Brown? Well, you can pick up the cycle of love. Uh, March sixteenth, it'll be available on iTunes and at, you know all the digital places. Uh, on the fourth of April, it'll be available in all the physical retail stores. 
can get it there. And if you really want to get it right now, you can go to my website, MauriceBrown.net, and pre-order before March 16th. Uh, the next project coming out will be the So You Out project, and so we're definitely looking forward to that. It's going to be more of me and my production and me rapping and spitting and producing other artists on the album. More like a 2011 Earth, Wind, and Fire, if you will. Beautiful. Maurice, we got to thank you for your time tonight. And for all the listeners out there, check out Maurice, myspace.com, hip to bop. It's got some incredible music on there. Scope TV, Maurice Brown. We'll see everybody soon.